Hi, I'm Pastor Bill with your Maple Minute for this Thursday, December the 17th, 2020. You know, you can, get, you can get or try everything under the sun, but none of it will fill an empty life. To drive home his point, Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes recounts some of his own ex- life experiences and tells us how frustrating and how futile they are. We, we pick up on this idea as he gives us the search for meaning. Have you ever thought about meaning in life or purpose? It'll drive you crazy, but it also will drive you to the end that the only meaning in life is really with God. At the end of the chapter 1 in Ecclesiastes, Solomon uh, begins his search or recounts some things that had happened in his life as he begins his search for meaning in life or purpose in life or happiness, the elusive happy life, grand, grand life. In verses 12 through 18, Solomon tells us that he searches for meaning of life and wisdom. That's what a lot of people do these days. The more educated you are, the better you are. And and to a point, I I believe education is vitally important. But Solomon says this in verses 12 through 18. He says, I, the preacher, have been king over uh, over Israel in Jerusalem. And I applied my heart to seek out and search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. My heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Solomon is describing the futility of searching for fulfillment in life through learning. Was Solomon soured on education? Was he against knowing more? Not one bit. In fact, Solomon's wisdom is legendary. He had pursued wisdom whenever he could be found, and he was the most educated person of his time. In fact, he's described as the wisest man to have ever lived. Yet, to his surprise, the more he lived, the emptier he felt. T.S. Eliot, the author T.S. Eliot, wrote this, All our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. And simply, you could put it in other words, the more we learn, the smaller we feel. You know, Solomon pursued education, he pursued wisdom, he pursued knowledge, not just to get better at, at, at knowing things or pursuing really a relationship with God. He pursued those things to fulfill his life. And if that's the center of your life, education, knowledge, wisdom, then you're going to come up and find it's empty. The the fuller that he tried to put and master those fields of of study, the emptier Solomon felt. For all of its benefits, though, education and, and intellectual attainment can only speak to us about life under the sun, life here on this planet, life without God for the most part. Knowledge and power can simply lead to more creative ways to rebel against the goodness of God and his reason. That's what Solomon understood. Do I think knowledge is important? Absolutely. But knowledge without God is a waste of time. That's what Solomon found out. Then he put his search for meaning in wild living. In chapter 2, in the first three verses, Solomon wrote this. He said, in my heart, come now, I will test myself with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. That's what he's telling himself, and that's what a lot of people tell themselves today. Just have a good time. But behold, this also was vanity, waste of time, worthless. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart and how to cheer, uh, now to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom. And, And you see, I want you to understand what he's saying there. He's saying, I didn't lose full control. I handled the, the alcohol in my life, which that's, that's a bad suggestion anyway. But he says, I, I could handle I still had all my wisdom. I didn't get so drunk that I was out of it. And how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven. He said, I was just drinking socially, just having a good time, just partying a little bit. I just want to see what it was like. And what did he say? He said, that I I saw what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I I tried it all. I tried it all. I didn't just stick with wisdom and and get my degrees and diplomas and all the rest of those things. I tried a little bit of wild living. People do that today. In fact, 
Solomon began with his, his search with amusement in chapter 2, verse 1, and he realized that this does bring with, uh, wise uh, realization that it's just empty. In fact, it led him to a conclusion that he wrote over in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 13. He says, even in laughter the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. Solomon went down the road of pleasure and found that it led nowhere but really to destruction. And that's what so many people find out today. The third aspect he talks about in his search for meaning is the search for meaning in work. So many of us do this. Hey, if, if I know wisdom, I may not be the smartest guy. In fact, I don't even like to go to school. We may say things like that. And, and, and we know that wild living probably isn't going to be successful because we've seen the results of that as we've seen so many who've died at early ages for abuse and, uh, of alcohol and drugs and, and other narcotics and, and addictives. So we throw ourselves into work and we say, you know what, this has got to be a good thing because God created me to work, so I'm just going to be, uh, I'm going to make myself a, a, a famous person. I'm going to make myself something by doing the best I can. And that's good to do your best. But this is what Solomon said about finding meaning in my work and life. He said in verses 4 through 6 of chapter 2, he said, I made great works. And notice how often he uses the I or me or myself in this. He said, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. <clears throat> um, and, and when we get down to the end of this, as, as Solomon does this, um, he realizes that certainly work is a good thing and an honest day work is fulfilling, but it won't be something that fulfills your life. I've never, I've never heard anybody at the end of their day, uh, at the end of their life, sit back and say, you know what, I wish I had done a little bit more work. I wish I had just done a little bit more work. I wish I had just worked harder, stayed longer at the office, worked harder in the field, uh, spent more hours doing, doing the things that would make me something. No, that's not what happens. See, Ecclesiastes teaches us that our work or our projects Though they're generally worthwhile, if we look for them as the source of ultimate meaning in our life, we will invariably dis be disappointed. I remember years ago, I had a boss in, in a secular job who, uh, he told me, and he was not a Christ follower, he told me, he said, you know what, we don't, <clears throat> we don't live to work, we work just so we can live. And I know that's probably something that somebody else said, but he really uh, gave me a good clue about, hey, let's not try and involve the meaning of our life in our work. The fourth aspect of, of, search, of the search that Solomon puts for meaning in life is in something that we all think is necessary. That is wealth. <laughs> it really is. We live in the one, number one wealthiest nation in the world as far as uh, per, per person. And I'm telling you that, that you may not feel wealthy, but according to world standards, you're in the top percentage of people of this, on this planet as being wealthy. You may not think so, but you are. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, Solomon said this. He said in his journey, he said, I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been there before me in Jerusalem. Also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. I'm giving myself something because I've worked so hard. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. You know, Solomon, uh, Solomon understood something that we're figuring out today. I read a report <clears throat> by the World Value Society that they uh, found uh, amongst these nations of the world. They did a happiness index. And they rated, and, and get a load of this, the happiest country in the world, according to them, was the country of Nigeria, one of the poorest countries of the world. You know, the United States was only 16th in this. There were a lot of other third world nations that were ahead of us. 
Researchers concluded their report by saying this. They said, survey after survey has shown that the desire for material goods is a happiness suppressant. Did you hear that? The desire for material goods is a happiness suppressant. That explains a lot about the United States because we want, we want our stuff, but it doesn't bring happiness. It doesn't bring that fulfillment of life. Solomon made a timeless error in his quest for meaning. He sought it in things and experiences, and that's what so many people are doing today. We're looking for the experiences and the things of life. He searched in wisdom and wild living and work and in wealth for the meaning of life, but what he found out, it was all worthless. Because once again, the true meaning of life only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The God who created us wants to know us, and that's why Christmas is so special. Because that was his way of sending his only son to walk among us and not pretend to be around us, but to really dwell with us, to live like us, and to know us. And he wants to know you. So as we approach Christmas, let's make sure we're celebrating the holiday in the right way. And let's not search for that great gift that you might think you need this year, that great thing you might need to have, or even that great relationship. Let's search for the relationship of God. God sent his only son, born in a manger, to die on a cross, that he might free us from the bondage of sin and slavery so that we can have a relationship with him. Won't we share that this holiday with somebody else?